Uh, we have a federal grant, a USDA grant for integrated pest management in Ohio. Uh, and Mary, Dr. Mary Gardner and I work on the uh, pollinator health portion of that grant. So with our portion of the, the larger grant, we developed this plant by numbers program. So we were able to grow out a lot of these plants and provide them to education and demonstration sites across the state, to 80 different sites. So um, here in Worcester, there are three sites. There's uh, three plantings. They're just little baby plants, so they're just going in now, but uh, something to watch as they develop. There's one at the Center for the Arts. Um, there's a planting at the College of Worcester outside the Science Building, kind of the, the student uh, community garden there on campus. And then um, at Secret Arboretum, there'll be another, uh, another of those plots. All right. So, um, so we're worried about our uh, creatures. I think every day in the news, we're hearing more and more about species that are lost, um, numbers of birds that have diminished, loss of, of insect species. It's really this biodiversity crisis. Um, and biodiversity isn't really something complicated um, in, um, if we think about the etymology, it's really the, the life on earth and the, the diversity of those creatures. So all the different species, the populations, how they work together and the services that they provide um, in, in, um, on Earth. Um, so we're seeing what some have called the sixth mass extinction. Um, so it's the sixth time in world history that a large number of species have disappeared in unusually rapid succession, um, caused this time not by asteroids or ice ages, uh, but by humans. And you know the pace of that loss is, uh, is, is staggering to researchers who uh, span the globe studying it. And you know, look at human activity, whether it's our uh, development, our home construction, um, uh, some of our farming practices, uh, the way that we're a, really a global economy. And so a lot of invasive insects have, uh, has, have moved around the world. So lots of different features that are lots of different issues that have uh, compounded that loss of species. Um, and some of the smallest creatures are the ones that are um, most effective. So the plight of insects, um, the, the uh, renowned E.O. Wilson um, said that the little, they're the little things that run the world. So they're, um, they're breaking down organisms. They're turning plants into energy for other creatures. Um, they're pollinating plants. They're part of the, the food web. They have so many different roles that we don't often think about. Um, and you may come here as a, as a gardener or as a naturalist, someone who's interested in um, the, the um, biological world and all that's happening. A lot of people see an insect and they think, you know, where's the swatter? Where's the, uh, the hammer? The, where's, how am I going to get rid of it? Um, but they really do play a key role in um, our life on Earth. Um, and if we think back to... Um, you know, a decade, two decades ago, maybe to our childhood, uh, depending on how old we are, uh, we can think of the bugs that used to be on our windshields when we went on a long drive or on the, the grill of our car um, or that accumulated in the light fixtures, our porch lights, the moss that used to come, um, the shows of, of lightning bugs that we used to see, the number of monarch butterflies. You know, there are a lot of ways to think about um, how our lives have changed in, in what we see in the insect world. In the bee world, which is mostly what I work with, I work with wild bees and not so much honeybees. So all of those wild bees that are out there um, naturally, we have about 450 species in Ohio, so a lot of bee diversity. Um, and this projection from University of Vermont shows a, about a 23% loss in bee abundance. So abundance is the sheer number of creatures out there. So it's not even the, the decrease in species, but just the mass. Of, of insects out there. So um, a significant loss in uh, bee abundance is projected. You can see here from their, um, their projection, you know, we're very yellow in this Midwestern area along the Mississippi River Delta um, as we look at, at the use of farmland, uh, pesticide use, development, all these uh, features that really impact uh, insect life. Uh, maybe you've heard of the rusty patch bumblebee. Has anybody uh, heard of this? Got a nod there. So um, the first bee to be added to the endangered species list in the continental U.S. Um, so we've had other bees listed in Hawaii, but this is our first um, bee in the, uh, the continental U.S. to be added to the endangered species list. So um, for bumblebees, we're really looking at the, the um, color patterns on their abdomen as the main way that we can learn the different species. 
So you may see uh, three or four um, or more, depending on your landscape, different species of bumblebees. Um, they're out, out right now. Um, but you probably won't see the rusty patch. Um, this bee hasn't been seen for really commonly for two decades in Ohio. Um, it's not extinct, it's just extirpated or, or not found anymore in the state. Um, the way that we can tell the rusty patch, I had a program uh, last week when uh, with, with families um, at a library and I said, um, what, what do you think gave the rusty patch its name? And the little girl said, well, it's got kind of a rusty patch, right, on, on the back, uh, on the abdomen um, of that bee. So the head is kind of tucked down here. Here's the thorax where the wings and legs are attached. And, uh, and this is the abdomen, so that, that third portion of the adult uh, bee. And so we, we count those color patterns. Um, and on the rusty patch, we have this butter yellow coloration that completely encircles that rusty patch. So we do have a brown belted bumblebee in Ohio. It's a fairly common bumblebee. Um, and it has, as you can imagine, a brown belt. So it has a yellow band here and a brown patch here, uh, but no lighter yellow on the, on the underside of that patch. So, um, but if you even see something that you think might be a rusty patch, get excited, take a picture with your phone, call me, call somebody, um, call, and uh, we hope to be able to, to find that bee and also to study why we've lost the bee from, uh, from Ohio. Kind of, uh, we, we think more broadly about our other bee species and how they might uh, be threatened as well. So there was a research study that um, Dr. Karen Goodell and uh, Dr. Randy Mitchell from University of Akron, uh, Dr. Goodell's at uh, University of at OSU in Newark, um, they came together to survey the state to try to find the rusty patch. And um, through two years of survey work with their students and community science scientists out there looking, um, unfortunately, we didn't find any uh, rusty patch bumblebees. So there are robust populations in other states, actually outside of, in the city of Chicago, um, in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Um, so there are some robust populations, but, uh, but not in Ohio. So it makes us wonder, you know, what's going on with the, the rusty patch and other bees? Why this decline? Um, if you follow the, the honeybee, you know that there are a lot of threats to honeybees, including pathogens and pests. Also, lack of flowers out there, um, issues with uh, stress on those bees, some issues related to um, climate change, some hot temperatures that are stressful. Um, and many of our wild bees face the same threat. So, um, you know, smaller population genetics, even if we do find a little, a little a surviving population of, of rusty patch bumblebee in Ohio, how diverse are those genes? And, you know, what have we lost um, by losing a lot of those individuals? Um, the impact of pesticides, certainly if those are herbicides that are killing bee food, right? Uh, getting rid of weeds and other flowers that are important. Uh, and then, um, you know, habitat loss in general. So kind of all these factors coming together that really threaten a lot of, of species, including um, um, honeybees and other wild bees. Uh, but it's not just the insects that are threatened. Um, our birds have faced a lot of threats lately, and there have been some studies that kind of outline uh, the threats that birds face. Um, you know, we think of birds and we put out bird food that's uh, seed-based, right? We put out the millet and the sunflowers, um, or maybe we grow surface berry that has fruit that the birds feed on. Um, but for that protein source, for those immature birds, it's really the insects and the spiders that they're dependent on. And so, um, so we're actually growing uh, bird food if we invite a lot of those different creatures to live in our gardens and on our plants. And so this recent study that came out published in Science, um, researchers at seven institutions showed a decrease by 2.9 billion um, birds that we've, we've lost since 1970, um, including birds in every ecosystem. So there's definitely something you know, pretty frightening going on. Um, and and the, the bird and insect picture are interrelated. Um, so you may have um, heard of Dr. Doug Tallamy, who is a researcher out of the University of Delaware, and he's done a lot of work with, uh, with birds and insects and kind of putting this picture together. Um, so what does bird food look like? Well, it is the seeds, it is the fruit, but it's also those insects and spiders um, that these breeding birds are taking back and feeding to their young. 
Um, so here's um, a study that Doug Tallamy did looking at some of our native plants, and he is really um, uh, in love with oaks. So he, uh, so, you know, whatever your interests are, maybe you're interested in, in flowers or sports cars or, you know, whatever we train our eye to see, then we see it everywhere. Um, and he's trained to see caterpillars. And so he can go to an oak tree and um, through really careful observation can find and identify um, different caterpillar species. And so he's counted uh, 534 different Lepidoptera, and that's butterflies and moths, um, species that uh, will live on an oak tree. So if you think about an oak tree in your yard or in the park, uh, you know, in the parking lot, we don't think of the leaves being totally tattered. Um, there's a balance out there. There are all these moths and butterflies that may lay their eggs and caterpillars that may feed on those trees, um, but then birds are coming along and eating lots of those creatures. So it's not like we plant an oak and it's gonna be devastated because of the, the caterpillars. There's really this wonderful dance out there that's happening. So over 500 uh, species of butterflies and moths that live on, that can live on an oak tree. Um, here's Dr. Tallamy and some of his uh, book titles um, most recently, the, um, the Nature of Oaks, so really focusing on that important group of plants. Uh, but he's also author of Nature's Best Hope, really talking about our gardens and, and community gardens and spaces that we have a little bit of control over, um, how we can incorporate practices that really help insects and then help birds. Uh, Bringing Nature Home was his uh, first book in, uh, I think it was 2006, um, that really helped highlight the importance of native plants. And for plant by numbers, we've really drawn on um, those native plants to incorporate into uh, landscapes. And then he also, if you're a gardener, um, you may want to look for The Living Landscape that he wrote with Rick Dark, who is an amazing horticulturist. So it's really that blend of the naturalist perspective from Doug Tallamy, but the horticulturist perspective, how you can uh, bring these plants together and really design a beautiful garden. So, um, so of these, what, what uh, Dr. Cal Tallamy calls keystone species, these most important uh, plants out there for, uh, for birds, for caterpillars, and, um, and for other creatures, um, the oak is really at the top. And so to contrast that, um, Doug went to his neighbor um, who has a calorie pear. I'm sure you've seen a calorie pear. I think there's a few out here in the parking lot. Um, this is a little walking path not far from me. Um, and they didn't plant any of these calorie pears. Um, this is our, you know, our latest big invasive problem uh, because birds feed on that fruit. Uh, the fruit is now fertile. Um, the seed is fertile. It didn't used to be. We've had some, some um, cross-pollination of those pears. And so now the, um, the fruit has fertile seed. Birds eat that and everywhere they poop, then now we have the, um, the calorie pears really proliferating. Uh, we used to have that mostly in, uh, we used to see that mostly in Southern Ohio and um, slowly it's crept forward. And so now many of our, you know, roadsides and other open areas are full of, of uh, calorie pears. So a lot of people think, you know, it doesn't, why does it matter? What's, uh, yeah, it's beautiful, you know, in the spring, it's just full of white flowers. It smells terrible, but uh, you know, what's really wrong with that? Well, so with Doug's eye, he combed through um, all these, these calorie or sometimes called Bradford pears um, and only found one caterpillar species. Okay, so to contrast, we have over 500 caterpillars that can survive on an oak, um, only one species that can survive on, um, on a calorie pear. And so here's that, um, that top list from Doug Tallamy of those keystone plants. Um, and the ones that I have in yellow are my particular favorites because they happen to be good, not just for caterpillars, not just for birds, uh, but also for pollinators. So the oaks and willows, um, cherries and plums and crab apples, um, having all of them, you know, over 300 uh, species of butterflies and moss associated with them. Uh, birch and uh, poplar cottonwood, also really great for caterpillars. They just happen not to be the kind of pollen that we see bees uh, collecting. And so, um, you know, they're great to grow, but for my perspective, trying to encourage pollinator habitat, they're not um, at the top of my list. 
So tulip poplar is a really great, um, or, or tulip tree, it's a really great nectar source. Um, honeybees love it, a lot of bees are attracted to it. I think it gets um, uh, poor press because those flowers are so high, unless you have a columnar or maybe a younger tree with limbs that are a little lower, it's really hard to see those beautiful flowers. Uh, but yeah, I don't know how many, um, how many butterflies and moss are associated with tulip poplar, but I know it's really great for, um, uh, for the nectar source. What about maples? Um, so maples, um, uh, maples are pretty good. They just don't happen to be kind of at the top of that keystone species list. I think because they don't support as many butterflies um, but, and moths, but um, they really are great for pollinators. Um, they provide that early season pollen and nectar. So if you think of a queen bumblebee who spent all winter, maybe um, in your compost pile or in your yard, six inches or so underground, um, she comes out really early in the spring, maybe it's mid to late March, um, she's pretty hungry and she has to set up the whole nest for her offspring. Um, and so she needs those early season food sources. That can look like ephemeral wildflowers. So, you know, think of Worcester Memorial, other beautiful places that have those, um, those woodland wildflowers. But many of our gardens, you know, we can't grow those wildflowers, but we can grow trees. And so the maples and willows really important for those um, early season bees. Um, so those were our keystone species. Here's uh, another example, and not to pick too much on ginkgo. There were some ginkgos planted on, in streetscapes. I took a nice walk around Worcester before we started. It's a beautiful tree. It has a long history. It's a non-native tree. Um, beautiful leaves. Uh, what, what color do they turn in fall? Does any, has anyone seen this? Just like a beautiful golden yellow, and all the leaves uh, fall in a day. So you'll have a, a just this golden, golden display, and then all of a sudden, all the leaves fall. Um, very sculptural in the landscape. Uh, and so I guess my point about ginkgos is not that um, you should not plant ginkgos or you should get rid of your ginkgo. It's just that you think of it a little more as sculpture in the landscape. It provides um, you know, really beautiful structure. It can provide shade. It can help create you know, cooling and, and um, process pollutants and filter water like many of our other trees do. But it's really not food for, uh, for caterpillars. It's not providing anything for, uh, for birds or for bees. So it's not that you shouldn't grow ginkgo, just, um, you know, I'd like us to kind of um, step back and broaden our thoughts about tree selection, uh, why we choose a tree, how it fits into the landscape, um, but also how it can help uh, biodiversity. So it's really those natural relationships. Um, how does this, this plant provide food? Um, does it provide nesting habitat? Does it provide um, it, it, some small insects that are prey for somebody else? Um, does it provide um, insects and, or food for insects and spiders that are then eaten by, uh, by birds? So how are those uh, plants really adding to that complexity of uh, the natural landscape? So for, uh, well, it's, you know, it's hard to think about time now with the pandemic, but um, so probably for the last eight um, years, uh, we've been through this pollinator education um, and, and health grant. We've been growing out and providing native plants for uh, education and display gardens across the state. Um, and so this is one of the, um, the gardens that we help support. So we don't go out and create these gardens, but we help other people provide plants and, and signage and so on. So this is actually um, part of the, uh, the landscape at the Smucker store in Orville, if you're familiar with that, kind of off to the side um, along um, a little ridge. Uh, but we were able to provide a lot of this uh, plant material and you know, really, um, really strong flowers for pollinators. So we have an amazing grower up at our muck crops grants. At, at our muck crops station, our field station. Um, I have to tell you that that is in Celeryville, where else would a muck crops uh, field station be? So it's our station that really studies vegetables, vegetable pests and production. But uh, we have an amazing grower up there who's on staff and he grows out um, a lot of these um, native perennials. And then we're able to provide those to different locations across the state. So our main focus was really about pollinator habitat. How can we provide plants that have pollen and nectar resources for, uh, for all those bees and butterflies and other pollinators? 
Um, and now we're trying to expand that because I think you know a lot of that message is getting out. People are, are interested in, in pollinator habitat. They want to invite the pollinators. Um, but now we're trying to build in, well, how, how else do these plants function in the landscape? Um, how do they serve uh, the whole ecosystem? You know, do they provide um, habitat for spiders, which uh, hummingbirds are collecting to feed their offspring, um, spiders and other, um, uh, and, and small insects? Um, you know, are they providing places for uh, predators like wasps to gather prey? Um, are they providing nesting um, habitat, uh, maybe uh, bird construction habitat? Um, a nest construction habitat, uh, seeds, and other, um, other services. So I don't know what your garden looks like, um, but you know, a lot of our landscapes are not very diverse. They have um, a lot of lawn, which tends to not be very diverse. Um, we have a strong focus on having a green lawn and not having weeds like dandelions and, and white clovers and others that really can benefit pollinators. Um, you know, maybe a few um, small trees, maybe a few flowers, um, but are those flowers even offering pollen or nectar for, uh, for pollinators? So oftentimes, you know, pretty sterile habitats. Um, this is a Japanese tree lilac, which is also out here in the parking lot. It's kind of just finishing its bloom time. Um, and it can be visited by some bees, um, but it's not as uh, important for, it's a non-native tree, um, not as important as a, as a host plant for butterflies and moths. Has a relatively short bloom time, and so really doesn't add much uh, in the long term. Um, so we're trying to work through uh, with folks, how can we um, kind of expand the diversity of what we grow in the landscape? Um, and I'm not one of those people who says everything should be native, that the only plants that we should include um, are native plants. I love my basil and my parsley and my raspberries. I mean, there are a lot of non-native plants that we depend on um, for food or for fun, for flowers. Um, and so I'm all about how can we add a few more native plants into the landscape? Um, how can we demonstrate the, the benefits, the um, horticultural um, uh, worthiness of these plants? Um, and then how can we include them in whatever garden um, style you have? So not everybody is kind of a loose and uh, a wild look for as a gardener. Um, some people like things very, you know, just so in rows and with uh, neat patterns. Um, and my perspective is that we can use native plants no matter your, um, your your style of gardening or your preferred way to garden. There's a way to incorporate at least a few more native plants. Um, now you'll notice I have um, red clover, uh, which is a weed, and I have uh, an ornamental cherry. This is a, a non-native cherry. Um, our native cherries are really great, but non-natives are, are great in spring as well. Um, so not just native plants, but um, more flowers in the landscape. You know, if we think about um, whatever way you take to get here, whatever drive uh, or walk that, um, that gets you to the library, um, we don't have as many roadsides. We don't have as many wildflowers. Um, even our, um, you know, our, our street um, scapes, our uh, commercial landscape plantings, not very rich in flowers. And we know through research that um, the more flower diversity we have, so the different kinds of flowers, different shapes and sizes, colors, um, different plant families, um, different bloom time, uh, the more diversity in our gardens, the more bee diversity we're gonna have. So if we have a richness of um, you know, lots and lots of flowers, but also lots of different colors and shapes and sizes and bloom times, we're, we're gonna in, be inviting to a lot more bees, uh, butterflies, and other pollinators. So this is an image from iNaturalist, which is a community science um, app uh, or computer uh, website that you can visit. You can take pictures, what we call observations, of anything living, living or formerly living that you see. And so these are all bee observations that people have taken. Um, and these are um, the bees that are most commonly seen on iNaturalist in Ohio. So it's not that these are necessarily the most common bees, but they're the ones that people notice and took pictures of from the most common. And then this actually keeps going down, down onto the carpet. I think we have 181 species so far that have been observed. Um, so lots of different bees and you know, lots of different flowers. You can just um, see the colors and different shapes and sizes. So adding more flowers um, to the landscape is really critical. 
Um, this is a project that uh, was really spurred by the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. Um, don't know if you've been there lately. It really is a horticultural botanical garden um, it, that happens to have some really cool exotic animals. Um, but they do work on plant conservation and also um, displaying different horticultural plants, both native and non-native. Um, they promote different plants. Um, so they have a group of plants that are called the zoo's best for pollinators. They have some really nice handouts online. Uh, and so they have out of their zoo's best for pollinators um, that are really you know, focused on the zoo and, um, and, and Hamilton County. Um, they came to OSU and said, we'd like to demonstrate these plants and really study them across the state. We know they're great at the zoo for pollinators, but how do they, um, you know, how do they work in Columbus or in Cleveland or in Toledo? And so the zoo provided the plants. There are 14 different uh, perennials, and they were planted at 14 different locations. Extension offices here at Seacrest Arboretum, uh, Master Gardener planting some, um, some fairgrounds. And this is from Dawes Arboretum in Newark. Um, and so we're growing, we're all growing the same set of, of plants, um, some native and some non-native. And we're observing those plants um, at least twice a month for pollinator visitation. So we're trying to do more research to figure out what plants uh, pollinators really like and um, how we can uh, incorporate those then, recommend those. And it's really interesting. Some of the plants that the zoo said are awesome really are. Others, at least in the trial garden that I'm watching in uh, at Dawes, um, I don't get a lot of pollinator visitation. You know, are there different bees that visited these plants in Cincinnati? Um, did they bloom a little differently, at, you know, at Dawes versus maybe in, in Cleveland? Um, it's something that we hope our, our research will, uh, will demonstrate. So people are interested in uh, pollinators. Here's a group that's at the Cincinnati Zoo walking around looking at some of their um, display beds. Uh, we're doing a lot more pollinator um, habitat on, um, on you know, sidewalks and streetscapes. Um, this is at the Farnsworth uh, Museum in, um, in Maine. Um, and they have a, an entryway really focused on native plants, uh, really lovely leading up to the front door. Um, this is Franklin Park Conservancy, uh, Franklin Park Botanical Garden and um, Conservancy in, um, in Columbus. Um, really lovely if you haven't been there lately, if you have a child uh, that you can borrow or take. They have a really great kids garden, but they also have a free, um, a free portion of Franklin Park that um, is open. It's a, it's a Columbus Park and you can just walk through. They have um, uh, vegetable beds, herb beds. They have an outdoor kitchen. They really do a lot of great demonstration there. Um, they have a pollinator garden um, and are really trying to teach folks about um, uh, planting for pollinators. So all these different approaches to um, getting people more familiar with some of these plants, um, giving ideas for how we can use these uh, in our own landscapes. Um, here in, um, in Ohio, there's a lot of work through the Midwest Native Plant Society, and on their website, they have a lot of good information, um, including this uh, yard sign. I think it's six, six by 10 or so. It's a fairly small, nice metal yard sign. Um, beautiful. Um, uh, developed by the artist uh, Ann Geis, and um, it's something you can put out in your yard that helps your neighbors kind of know why your yard maybe is a little messy. That's my yard is a little messy, a little loose, I guess, um, but lots of things in bloom. Um, and so having a sign can be a really nice way to, um, to tell people what you're doing. So at this point, I'd like to um, pass the mics, the multiple mics over to Emily. Um, who's going to talk a little bit about her research and her interests. So I saw Emily earlier in the day, and she showed me a, um, <laughs> uh, a bumblebee nest that she discovered quite by accident living in a mulch pile at the Arboretum. Uh, no stings were had, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Good. Let me just test the buttons. Yay, okay. Hello, um, I'm Emily, as Denise has said. Um, I'm a student at the College of Worcester. I'm going into my senior year. Am I talking loud enough? I'm kind of quiet sometimes, so you can tell me to speak up if you need to. Um, and I am a summer intern at the Arboretum as a part of the OREP program, um, the OSU Research Internship Program. So this runs through, I guess, technically a few weeks in May um, to the end of July. 
And so I am paired with a few advisors at the Arboretum, um, Denise being one of them. And I had to come up with a project to fill the summer months. So we were just kind of, you know, thinking about what I could do. Um, I've been interested in doing bee work before. I, um, two years ago now at the College of Worcester, I did sampling um, in the pollinator gardens there to look at what bees we had. Um, just continuing projects that other seniors had done in years before. Um, so we thought that I could kind of try to make an inventory of what pollinators are at the Arboretum. Um, and so, there we go. <laughs> um, we decided to use pan traps. Um, this is what I did two years ago at um, Worcester. And so pan traps are these, they're over there. Um, <laughs> These bowls, um, they're just like spray painted plastic bowls. You could probably buy them down the street at Drug Mart. Um, and so the standard practice is to have one white, one yellow, and one blue bowl. Um, and there's been research done into what colors are the best um, at attracting pollinators, especially um, bees is what I was basing mine off of. So fluorescent yellow and fluorescent blue are the big, um, it was really hard to find the spray paint, um, surprisingly. The blue spray paint in particular is like $25 on Amazon. <laughs> but so you get this fluorescent paint, you can just paint them. Um, we also used a chalky finish white color just because the, the bowl itself was kind of shiny just to even out the colors. Um, so they're kind of a matte finish. And then you just fill them with water and Dawn dish soap. And this just kind of sadly traps and kills the bees. Um, and then I can pick them up later. So I had done this before and my advisor at Worcester kind of said, you know, you could do this. Again, it could be interesting. Um, the Arboretum doesn't really have an inventory of like pollinators around the Arboretum at all. So they were, you know, just wanted to see if we could come up with a project that I could help them look at that. So using these bowls, um, I would put them out for 24 hours, leave them out the whole time. Um, I usually put them out in the morning, pick them up the next morning. And I do this every other week, so I've done it twice. I'm going to do it next week. And this is really useful because you don't have to sit out there and like net the bees or look at flowers for hours on end. You just kind of put them out. It takes me about an hour or two to put them out and then an hour or two to pick them up. And they're out for 24 hours. It's not the best method of um, sampling, but for my time, um, I'm also doing a lot of upkeep around the Arboretum, so it's easier for me to do that. And I have 54 total bowls, so it's six different locations. Um, you may have counted, that's only five, but there's one at the um, Worcester Science Building, which is a little bit down the road this way on the map. Um, they have a little pollinator garden strip there, so I have also put some bowls there just kind of to compare the different pollinator gardens. So we have one spot is, I'll come point. <laughs> One spot is over here at the Trial Gardens, um, formerly the Rose Garden. We have roses in it again, but it's not technically a rose garden. Um, this is where we put our plant by numbers plants in. So I'll talk about that, I think, at the end of my presentation, but one spot is there. And then we have kind of an open lawn area um, by the Discovery Pavilion, just to kind of see what was there. <laughs> I wasn't expecting much, but we did get a few when we sampled um, last week, had a few, especially butterflies. Um, this is right by the big slide, the famous slide at the Arboretum. Um, and in the kind of wooded forest natural area right by the stream, we put a few bowls there. And then all the way up at the top where it says 12 and 14, those are the prairie garden and the pollinator garden and kind of the Arboretum walk area on the trail. So six locations, each location I had three different spots. So I just kind of had a scope of the area. And then each spot had one of each color of bowl. So that's doing the math, that's 54 bowls total. Um, when I put the bowls out, I recorded the flower species that were um, flowering around, kind of just around the area of the bowl. So I can see maybe what's influencing what bees I'm getting. Also the time that I'm putting them out, the date that I'm putting them out and picking them up what the temperature is. Sometimes I write down, you know, the weather, if it's something to note, um, any other notes that I may have. A lot of the time the notes is that the bowls got tipped over. 
I think that we have some raccoons that are playing around with them. Um, I would love to get a field cam out there. We had, um, the one time I went out, all three of the bulls had been dragged a little bit down the trail. So I'm assuming that was some critter. Um, we think a raccoon is washing its hands in some of them. <laughs> so that's most of my notes. Um, and so after I come collect these, I just put the bees or um, also butterflies. I collected flies last time. Not going to do that again. There were so many flies. Um, but I pick up whatever, I'm, whatever specimen I'm going to look at. I put it in a vial with ethanol, which I don't think I brought any. Sorry, but it's just a vial. Um, and then I'll bring that to the lab. And then when I'm ready to pin, first I dry it. We have a little contraption with a PVC pipe and mesh, and you just put the bee in, and it's kind of like um, a little bee salon, I think is what we called it before. We just use a hair dryer to dry them off um, as gentle as we can. I decide if I want to glue or pin the bees. So on the bottom picture there, you can kind of see the two bees on the right are glued just because they're so tiny. Um, the bees on the two on the left are pinned because they're a little bit bigger. It's mostly just if I can get the pin in and still have the left side of the bee kind of unharmed is a general way to go, just to make sure that identification can still be done. And then once I have them either pinned or glued, I'll position, <laughs> take a little tiny tweezers and move their little legs and their hair and their wings and make sure everything is all ready. Um, I'm, I'm still learning the butterflies. Um, as you can see, some of them didn't go as well. Um, <laughs> Those were my first attempts. I'm getting better at it, but um, I had only done bees before, so we've decided to keep keep our butterflies and moths this time. Then you leave them this set for a day. So you can see in the butterfly and moth picture in the middle there, um, some of the butterflies have their wings kind of tamped down. And this is not like a professional setup by any means. Um, there's spreading boards and stuff that I could get, but this is just what I have for now. Um, and so those butterflies, I'm kind of holding the wings down. And I do that with the bees too. I keep them right onto the styrofoam so their legs can kind of be held in place by the styrofoam. And then after about a day has passed, they're all kind of like solidified and you can move them and they won't move out of shape. And then I use a, a microscope and I have another funny setup. I don't think I have a picture of it, but I think I have a Play-Doh cup and a ruler taped to the top of it. And it's on top of the lid of a Petri dish just so I can get measurements of the bees. Um, as you can see in the top picture, I try to get a ruler. Um, it got cut off, but that's centimeters, just so people can know the size of the bees. <laughs> and so I'll upload those to iNaturalist, which Denise had talked about. Um, I have my project. I didn't know which size QR code would work better, so I put both of them. Um, and I also put a link to it if you ever want to look at my project. Um, it's on iNaturalist, I believe. If you search projects and search something about maybe 2023 Seacrest, you should probably find it. Um, my picture is me standing by a tree, and I think my name is Green something, um, my last name. So I have this up for the public to see, and I am going to add every bee that I get this summer into the project, and it'll just, it'll help me um, kind of organize it. I'm also working on getting a project up for the Arboretum in general that will have kind of a location bound on the Arboretum. And then so every, any person that has an observation at the Arboretum, it'll automatically be uploaded into this project. And then you can look at, it has nice um, statistics of kind of the different species that there are, the different categories, times, you can see on the map where they were, um, just a way to organize things. And so mine will be further organized. My observations will also be in that project. Um, but mine will be, my project will be just mine, and I'll be able to see the different species that I have. So this is what I have right now. Um, I've only gotten photographed four bees right now. This is up to date as of like two hours ago, I think. I, I went in and re-added it because I got a new observation. Um, the Zidon Temerus um, was new. And so I try to identify them to genus, which is, kind of specific on the like taxonomic ranking. Um, I have a few books that I try to go through and then I'll put it on a naturalist and then hopefully someone else will help me out. Um, Melissa Spring knows a lot about bees and she has helped me a lot um, with identifications. But so that's what I have so far. And um, the research grade just means that there has been a cumulative 
two-thirds um, agreement on what the identification was. And yeah, so I have two that are, I guess, research grade right now, which is cool. And just to finish up, we have um, my pollinator, or not mine, but I guess I helped plant them. Um, the pollinator gardens at the Arboretum. I don't know how many of you have been to the Arboretum, Seacrest. Okay, a few people, good. Um, so this is by the Rose Garden, um, right, you know, right across the Welcome Center, the whole pergola area right there. Um, and so these two on the sides, I think they're kind of flipped, but um, those are the two bee gardens, so specialist bees and bumblebees that I believe Denise will talk about in a little bit. Um, and we have your flyers and everything has them. And then right in the middle is our butterfly and moth garden. So we have all our signs up and everything um, to show people what those are, and hopefully they'll grow up and be nice and happy and healthy. These pictures were from today, so <laughs> they will grow more. <laughs> um, and then those are kind of the areas that I've highlighted that I'm going to put my bowls in. I had them before we knew kind of where we were gonna put them. I had my bowl, I think, a little bit further back. This one was in the back of the rock, um, just to make sure people wouldn't mess with it, but then we have all our plants in the front, so I'm gonna move that one. And same with that one, it was a little bit further back. So I put them by the gardens. Um, and then hopefully I'll be able to see, you know, do a little comparison. It's not gonna be very statistically significant or anything, but um, just kind of see if there was a difference in the bees that I got when the garden, the plants weren't there and when they were there. And I think that there will be a difference. Um, I've already seen little creatures around there, which is nice. And I think that was all I had. All right, so let's talk about these, um, these different themes that we have. Let me scroll down just a little bit. Um, and so the first uh, theme that may be um, less familiar to you is uh, our specialist bee theme. So just like a monarch caterpillar needs milkweed to survive, to develop into an adult uh, monarch butterfly, specialist bees have to have a specific kind of pollen. Um, so some of those bees have a very narrow range of pollen that the moms can collect uh, to provision little nursery cells for the offspring. Um, usually, they, usually these are solitary ground nesting bees. Um, so they just have moms and dads. They don't have queens, workers, and drones. Um, the moms are out there visiting the flowers, gathering the pollen, um, and the dads were just, uh, just, but they were there to mate with the moms. They really don't do any work in the nest construction or provisioning. Um, and so, um, so this is on a, uh, an ironweed plant. This is an ironweed specialist, um, and she has uh, white uh, pollen pants. And so ironweed, it's that really tall pasture plant, right, a deep purple late in the summer. Um, it has very white pollen. And so that's the only type of pollen that this mom will collect for, uh, for her offspring. So about a third of all bees are, or about 100 species in Ohio, are specialist bees. Um, some have a little more broad uh, range of hosts that they can go to, so it may be uh, plants in the Asteraceae, the aster family. So maybe goldenrods and asters will work purple coneflower uh, in there. Other, others have a, a pretty uh, narrow range of plants that they can collect pollen from. Um, so another example of that is the, um, the hibiscus bee that only goes to um, some of our hibiscus plants that could be native or non-native. Here's that um, hibiscus turret bee. Um, so while they go to marshmallow and some of our garden hibiscus, they'll also visit Rose of Sharon, which is a non-native plant. Uh, but many times these bees have evolved, um, or most times they've evolved with these native plants. So they have, um, they, they depend, they rely on that native uh, plant to provide pollen. So on your handout, we have a list of some of those, um, those specialist bees. Oops. There we go. Um, and if you plant all of the, uh, the plants that are in the specialist bee garden, you will attract about 100 different specialist bees. Um, so let me back up just a minute. The plant by numbers project isn't something that I invented by any means. We, um, we really first saw this project at the um, Lexington, Kentucky park system. Um, and they, we linked to them online. They have uh, dozens of different garden designs, some for your mailbox, some for your front yard, some for the space by the sidewalk, some for a, a wet area, um, focusing on native plants with a sample design. Uh, and so we loved that idea. We got with the, the folks at the parks and said, can we adapt this for Ohio? Um, so, uh, so we started with the specialist bees, the bumblebees, and, uh, and butterflies and moths. So those specialist bees, um, many of them are specialist on 
uh, plants in the aster family, like I mentioned, goldenrod. Uh, here's a hairy banded mining bee. And so this um, mom only goes to uh, goldenrods and asters to gather um, that pollen for her offspring. That hibiscus turret bee is actually a bee that can walk on water. Um, so it's the edge of the wetland nesting bee. If you think of marshmallow, that pink uh, plant that blooms in wetland areas. Um, this bee is usually nesting close by. It's called the turret bee because it makes this little turret around it. It gathers water in its mouth, uh, it kind of dances on the water to, uh, to, to lap up that uh, water in the mouth and then flies back to uh, the edge of the wetland, mixes the um, water and, um, and the soil to make this little turret. Um, and we're not sure exactly what the turret's function is, uh, but perhaps to um, prevent predators from coming down um, to get the baby bees. So for each of our designs, we have um, a number of native plants that we've uh, featured. Um, we have a first option and a second option. So for the specialist bees, uh, we have things like asters and goldenrods. We have um, ironweed and other plants. Um, and as I said, about 100 specialist bees, if you planted all of these plants, um, would have the potential to uh, gather that pollen and, and nest nearby. I mean, you certainly don't have to plant all of those plants. Even if you plant one or two, um, you're going to provide food for, uh, for those specialist bees. Um, and here's that ironweed. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, the tall, um, there we go. Um, it doesn't have to be that tall pasture um, ironweed, and it doesn't have to be an acre of ironweed. It can be one plant. Um, so each bee um, this mom, she needs about seven little individual flowers to gather enough pollen to provision uh, one little nursery cell. So that's not seven acres or even seven plants. That's one plant with seven little tiny flowers. Um, so even one or two plants really make a difference for, uh, for these special species. And this was at Holden Arboretum uh, right out in front of their, um, their visitor center. Um, and lots and lots of these special species were, were visiting those plants. Um, on our Plant by Numbers website, we feature um, uh, the researchers who gathered this information about specialist bees, who highlighted some of the plants that are most important. Um, and so things that you may already be growing, like sunflowers, goldenrods, asters, I bet you grow black-eyed Susan, uh, maybe verbicina, the, the wing stem, the tall um, summer blooming um, yellow flower. Uh, and so we incorporated those into a design to uh, a six by 10 design to demonstrate uh, what, what specialist bees need. And as I said, we have first and second options for each of those, um, uh, for each of those designs. The first option may have a, a cultivar. So for, for this one, we have Jacob Klein as a suggested cultivar of bee balm. If you have a different bee balm, you can't find Jacob Klein, that doesn't matter. You can use what you have. Um, or if you prefer not to use a uh, cultivar, you can use the straight species. So our second options are all um, straight species, that is they're not cultivars. Um, so some native gardeners don't like to use those cultivars, um, so we have the straight species option. Okay, so let's look at some bumblebee favorites. Um, as I said earlier, bumblebees uh, overwinter as queens. We have um, about maybe half a dozen species that are fairly common that you might see in your backyard, three that are really easy to, to find, the common eastern uh, bumblebee, the brown-belted bumblebee, um, and the two-spotted. It's these two yellow spots here on the abdomen um, that make her, that give her her name. Um, so those are the most common bees, uh, bumbles in, um, in Ohio. And as I said, they overwinter as the queen who mated last year. Um, and so she comes out in early spring. She's either visiting wildflowers or those maples and willows early blooming flowers. Um, she has to set up the whole nest. So often we think of honeybees. They're uh, also a social bee. They live in a colony with the queen workers and drones. They have a perennial colony. So that colony itself survives multiple years. Uh, bumblebees have an annual colony. So that means the new queen who mated last year has to set up the whole colony this year, she lays eggs that will be her daughters, the workers, and then eventually eggs that will be um, drones, her, her sons, um, and then new virgin queens. And only those new virgin queens that emerge and mate in late summer or fall have the potential to survive next winter. So that old queen dies and all the workers and drones die. 
So in that design, we have um, uh, many plants that are both nectar and um, pollen sources for, uh, for bumblebees, some that are favorites. Uh, and I mentioned that study that um, Karen Goodell and Randy Mitchell conducted a few years ago where they went across the state looking for the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, they didn't find it, but they observed 30,000 bumblebees on flowers and they made note, like Emily's doing, of all those flowers um, that the bees were visiting. And so their work helped to inform which plants we chose for, uh, for this design. You know, which ones are the bumblebees really, uh, really visiting in our gardens? Um, we included not only those, those flowering plants, but also um, some grasses. Um, to give an example, um, not that we know that bumblebees will nest in your garden and maybe you don't necessarily want them to nest in your garden, um, but they will often nest at the base of bunch grasses. And so we give some options for, uh, for bunch grasses in this garden design. And maybe if you're lucky, I think um, some bumbles will come and nest uh, at the base of those bunch grasses. Uh, the very best plant that you can uh, incorporate into your garden for bumbles, having trouble with this clicker, there we go, um, is bee balm or monarda. So either wild bergamot or our bee balm um, or other monardas, they're really the, uh, the key plants for bumblebees. Um, there's, a, there's a national bumblebee study called Ask a Bumblebee that community scientists are participating in where we go out and look um, for bumblebees and which plants, which flowers they're visiting. And what we've learned so far, it just started last year, is that if monardas are in bloom, that's where the bumblebees are going. We're, we're just not, you know, it's like the most popular restaurant in town and we're not seeing uh, bumblebees on other flowers when the monarda is a choice for them. So if you only plant one flower to encourage bumblebees, um, that would be a good one to choose. Uh, our last theme is, uh, is butterflies and moths. And so here we really wanted to highlight the importance of those caterpillars um, for, uh, for many of our birds. And so we've tried to um, help people with the association between the adult butterfly or moth, um, that larval stage, right? We know we need the caterpillar if we wanna have the adult butterfly or moth, uh, and then those host plants. So um, each of these uh, adult species needs a, a host plant to lay eggs, uh, for that caterpillar to feed and then eventually pupate and mature as an adult. So trying to help people make that connection, um, not just the nectar for butterflies, which is important, but it's also that host plant that the caterpillars need. Um, and helping, I think, to um, get gardeners used to the idea that these caterpillars are gonna be eating the leaves, right? And so um, you're gonna see some leaf tissue gone, uh, which, which is a good thing in a, in a butterfly and moth garden. So if you planted all of the species in this theme, um, it would uh, be home for, uh, be host food for 330 different butterfly and moth species. So I'm not like Doug Tallamy, I couldn't tell you which caterpillars are there, but, um, but hopefully you'll see some of the adults then also uh, visiting those plants. And of course, milkweeds are part of uh, this design because we definitely want um, to encourage those monarchs. So here's a plant you may be less familiar with, Golden Alexander. Does anybody grow Zizia or Golden Alexander? So um, a fairly early blooming. So mine was really kind of peak bloom. I live in Maslin um, about two weeks ago, and it's a member of the carrot family. So if we think of our, you know, our parsley or Queen Anne's lace has that umble shaped flower. Um, each little individual uh, flower in that, um, in that cluster is very small. And so um, this is great uh, nectar sources for insects with small tongues, right? So you probably won't see a bumblebee on a zizia just because bumblebees have longer tongues. And this is a, just a teeny tiny amount of nectar for them. So they would choose a different kind of, of uh, flower to feed on for nectar. But what we do see are other kinds of um, bees. Um, this is actually a specialist bee that needs zizia pollen to feed her offspring. Okay, so, so one thing about specialist bees is uh, we can take them into the lab, the, the larvae, and we can feed them other kinds of pollen. Um, they can still develop. So we could, we could force this larva of this bee um, to eat some oak pollen or to eat some aster pollen. Um, it could still develop, but when it emerges as an adult, the adult female is hardwired for that uh, zizia. So it automatically goes back to that host plant 
gathers the pollen to provision her cells for her offspring. So not only do we get the, um, the bees hopefully coming to the syzygia, we also get swallowtail butterflies. Um, and we often see these on our dill, right, or our fennel, uh, members of the carrot family, but um, here we have them um, trying to bring them in on this zizia. Um, another benefit of something like zizia, um, because that flower is very shallow, um, it can invite beneficial insects. So um, ladybird beetles, wasps, other small creatures, they need just a little bit of flight fuel and they don't have long tongues. Um, and so often those uh, flies and others will feed on your plants, they'll uh, drink a little bit of nectar, um, then they'll mate, and those, all those flower flies that Emily was finding in her bee bowls um, are looking for a little patch of aphids in your garden. Um, that's where the mom lays her eggs, and then her larva, the maggots, uh, will eat those aphids. Um, so we have an element of beneficial uh, insect control by having a lot of, of, of flower diversity, including those flowers with uh, really short uh, corollas. Are they specific just to Zizia or would it be Marcel or parsley or, and other blooming uh, greens? Yes, it's inviting to lots of, uh, lots of other beneficials because it's more than nectar. So nectar is more of a general food resource for insects. Um, it's that flight fuel. So lots of different wasps and uh, flies and others could come to those carrot flowers. Um, but for the pollen, then that's what the specials are visiting, is that specific kind of pollen. Yeah, so it's a great question. That nectar is more like a Gatorade for um, the insects, that flight fuel that they need. So spanning the season is also important, right? Having something in bloom um, throughout the season to invite, you know, we, a lot of people are like, why do I want wasps? Um, if you've been on Facebook, you know that wasps get a bad name. Um, but they're beneficial insects. They're gathering insects and spiders, feeding them to their young. They're helping to, you know, kind of create a balance of insects in our landscapes. So if we have those, um, this is a, um, a sedum, like an autumn joy sedum. Um, if we have those flowers that are, that are shallow, um, that wasps can drink a little nectar from, um, they can also find prey there and feed their offspring. So wasps are not just jerks, they're really beneficial. <laughs> so one of our future themes for next year is gonna be beneficial insects. So we're gonna try to incorporate those plants that are really inviting to lots of those different um, predators and other uh, beneficial insects. Um, here's a butterfly that I hope is coming to, uh, to my garden. I planted some of this, um, um, this violet. We had a, a prairie violet that we um, included in this theme, but you can use any violet. So even the one that's in your yard, it's a native violet. Uh, fritillary butterflies, are uh, their caterpillars are, um, need that violet for their, as a host food. And the fritillary, though, has a really interesting manner um, to lay her eggs. She doesn't carefully, like the monarch, carefully visit that leaf and lay an egg right on that leaf. Um, she kind of scatters her eggs in the area as she flies, uh, whether there are violets that um, she sees or not. And so those eggs hatch, and those little caterpillars have to uh, seek out and try to find violets uh, before they run out of energy. So it's a more haphazard way um, of, of spreading those eggs uh, in the landscape. <laughs> uh, most, uh, I'm not sure about this species. Most eggs hatch out in the first couple days. They don't have a lot of uh, hydration, um, so they're usually pretty quick to hatch, but I'm not sure about the, the fritillaries. Um, here's another uh, butterfly I love to see in my garden, the pearl crescent, because I grow a lot of asters. I have... Um, I have New England asters uh, and clear blue asters and others. Uh, I love to see the bumblebees on them, but it's also a host plant for the, the pearl crescent. So uh, we, we, uh, we did incorporate several asters into um, our garden designs. Some of them have a cultivar name, but again, you're welcome to you know, incorporate any aster um, that you have. Maybe you're already growing an aster that um, is suitable. Um, but we use the Mount Cuba Center. They do a lot of really great research on horticultural plants, including those cultivar studies, which cultivar is most attractive to pollinators or most attractive to hummingbirds. And so we used Jacob Klein 
um, in one of our designs because that was their most highly rated um, aster for, uh, no, sorry, the Jacob Klein is the Monarda uh, for uh, hummingbirds to visit. So uh, if you haven't visited that Mount Cuba Center online, um, it's a great way to learn about some of those studies and those specific plants. So aster important not just for um, butterflies and moss, but also for those, um, those specialist bees. Uh, we also, on the back of the handouts, we include a list and, and sources for uh, trees and shrubs uh, because we know we want to span the season with bloom. Uh, for bumblebees, it's, it's not enough just to provide perennials. Uh, those are herbaceous perennials. They're, you know, the queen is hungry early in the season. She needs those trees and shrubs. Uh, and then they're going all the way through some species to September, October, even November now, um, trying to find food. So, um, you know, just relying on kind of our meadow perennials isn't enough. We have to include those, those shrubs and trees um, to really span that season. So we give a suggestion for some, um, some woody plants uh, for each of the themes. So something like a dogwood, um, really great for specialist bees, whether it's the trees or the shrubs, um, providing that, um, that pollen for those specialist bees, but also nectar for lots of other creatures. Uh, and then here, this is from the um, um, National Wildlife Federation uh, Plant Finder. So if you haven't looked for that, and we also uh, have, a, have a link to that on our website, um, but it's a site that's a partnership between Doug Tallamy and the National Wildlife Federation. Um, you can put in your zip code and it'll help you find uh, native plants that are suitable to your area that are great for, uh, for butterflies and moss. And they'll list some of those species there on the website. Um, you can also, if you're trying to attract a certain butterfly, you can put the butterfly name in and it'll tell you which native plants um, are best for your area to plant. And you can have your own like little plant list um, there under your, um, under your, your, your garden in that, in that uh, native plant finder list. Uh, one of the best uh, native plants of the, as far as woodies go is pussy willow. So if you don't have room for a tree willow, I encourage you to put in a, a pussy willow, um, important for those early season bumblebees. Um, but there are also specialist bees that depend on willow. Um, so 14 different species of bee that have to have that willow pollen um, to rear their young. And then they're just super for um, some of those butterflies and moss. In fact, 289 different species of um, butterflies and moss. So again, that native plant uh, finder, here's what the, um, the logo looks like, and here's what you see online. So you can have your own um, list that you're searching. You can save it to uh, your garden, and they can help you, uh, you know, find places to, um, to source those plants. Uh, we also give you on the back of the handout places to find native Ohio plant nurseries. Um, it used to be a lot harder to find native Ohio plants. It's a lot easier now. More nurseries are realizing that people have green stuff that they'd like to exchange for plants. Uh, and why not grow it for um, native gardeners? So uh, we have a lot more nurseries uh, out there. Here's that list. Remember I showed you the Doug Tallamy list of keystone plants. Um, also on the National Wildlife Federation site, they have this uh, kind of cheat sheet that has the trees, the shrubs, and the flowering perennials that are good for butterflies and moss and that are also good for specialist bees. Um, so we've used that information to pull into our themes, but it's also great to look through uh, online as you make more uh, plant choices. Um, and on the back of the butterfly and moth handout, we included a, um, a little uh, quick look at some of those keystone species um, from Doug Tallamy's work. So let's talk a little bit about, um, sorry, this one here, about cultivars and hybrids. Um, and so as I mentioned, while we put some cultivar suggestions in the plant by numbers designs, you don't have to go with that uh, cultivar. You can use a straight species, which comes true from seed. Um, you can swap out another cultivar um, but some people are concerned about cultivars and wonder, or sometimes called nativars, uh, and wonder if pollinators and others find those as, as palatable as uh, the straight species. 
Um, and so this uh, is a study, this, this highlights the um, uh, nine bark shrub. So maybe you grow a nine bark, it's a native shrub that comes in different leaf colors. Coppertina is one of the leaf colors or one of the cultivars that has um, copper leaf color. Um, there are some more maroon um, nine barks. Uh, and so Doug Tallamy's lab did some work on those nine barks to see are they equal for pollinator visitation um, and for butterfly and moth uh, uh, as, as host plants. And what they found was those darker color leaves, so think of the maroon um, uh, and burgundy leaves, those are adaptations to prevent herbivores. So leaves change their composition to keep critters from eating them. Um, and some of those chemicals then give leaves that burgundy color. And so they found that those cultivars that had the deep color didn't have as many caterpillars feeding on them. So they still had the pollinator visitation, but not as good for um, caterpillars. So something to keep in mind. If you're choosing between a, um, a cultivar and another, um, you may look at that more green um, leaf color. And then, as I said, we went with um, uh, choices, uh, uh, suggestions from the Mount Cuba Center on both the Monardas and the Asters. So trying to provide to choose plants that are garden worthy and not just great for pollinators, uh, but really fit in the garden, are gonna be successful in the garden and, um, and, are, and are good food sources for pollinators. So sometimes the pollinators will tell us, right? They'll visit and they'll, they'll be uh, working those flowers. Um, sometimes they don't. And, um, and so it can be that um, the color, the shape, you know, the, the strange shape of a, a cone flower, um, or the like orange or green color that isn't as inviting. Um, so if you're not sure and you prefer not to use cultivars, just look for that straight species or find the, find the seed. So just a few other tips for uh, creating that habitat for pollinators. Sorry. Uh, when you do your garden cleanup, whenever that is, I did my fall cleanup in um, early April. And that was just when I got to it. So try to leave some of those stems cut at different heights for things like your purple cone flowers, your phlox, other perennials in your garden. Um, leave some of those stalks somewhere between knee and hip height um, because those can be good nesting sites for little solitary bees. Um, those bees live in the pithy center. They don't get back and harm the core of the plant. Um, and eventually those stems fall over and that's fine because those bees continue to develop in there and they'll emerge on their own. Um, it's the same sort of idea as having a bee house or bee hotel. This is a little um, bee that's really a little bee hotel that's uh, targeted for mason bees, and with this little sliding panel, so you could see the baby bees developing in there, and it's filled with these little um, tubes that they're going to nest in. Um, but I prefer more natural habitat, so having those stems and um, cavities around your yard versus all kind of together in a little um, cruise ship with no water. Right, so easy for disease to spread from bee to bee. Um, there is a mite that eats baby bee food. It's called a pollen mite. And so they can build up in those bee hotels. Um, so they're nice for nature centers or for schools, but for our, our garden habitats, um, I, I don't encourage people to use them. If you already have one, it's fine. Um, but I'd rather see you use just some natural habitat for those, uh, those bees to nest in. And what studies have shown is that more non-native bees, so introduced bees, tend to come to those bee hotels. Um, so we're not necessarily helping native bees, um, but it's cool to watch. So it's good for um, kind of educational uses. Um, this is what I was talking about, those bunch grasses. And this is a, um, a bumblebee. You can just see a couple individuals there. Um, they can live right at the base of those bunch grasses. So if you do grow bunch grasses, um, I encourage you to leave some of those leaf blades from last year because the bumblebees may come and nest there um, next season. And so here's uh, uh, the, the website that I keep mentioning, the, um, the site that has all of the handouts, the garden designs. We have some uh, PDFs up there if you want to print out a sign. Uh, there's a big one over there as an example, um, but we also have some smaller signs. And if you go to um, either the College of Worcester, uh, outside the science building, they have the sign up, um, or the, um, the Center for the Arts, they have that sign as well. So the back shows the design and gives you the plant list and some of those woody plants that you might wanna include um, for each of those themes. So those are on our 
on our website. Um, a lot, along with a lot of those links that I've mentioned, um, we have a, a guide to specialist bees of Ohio, some host plants uh, for pollen specialist bees for each of those themes, then we have some of those uh, great resources collected for you. Um, this is a, a three-year project, and so uh, we'll have new themes next year with more handouts and more um, education and demonstration garden, uh, more plants for those gardens. Um, so next year, we're going to focus on hummers and singers, so those plants that are great for songbirds and also hummingbirds. Um, good garden bugs, so those beneficial insects, how to invite them into the garden. Um, Dr. Mary Gardner is an expert on beneficial insects. She wrote a book called Good Garden Bugs. And she, in her wish list for plants, she said, can we please put in some milkweed? Because milkweed gets a lot of what? What's on your milkweed right now? I know it's all over mine. They're orange and they'll stain your fingers. Little aphids, right? Um, but aphids, you know, don't think of aphids as a problem. Aphids are food for somebody else. And so if there's a source of aphids in the garden, you're going to bring in the ladybird beetles, the lacewings, the other predators who are going to come and help to, um, to, to manage the population of those aphids. So she's like, I want plants that, have, that encourage aphids. So we're going to have a milkweed in there um, just for Dr. Gardner. Uh, and then based on the, um, the results of the study with the Cincinnati Zoo that I told you about, we're going to highlight some of those perennials that really rose to the top that we saw across the state really invited a lot of bees and uh, butterflies and other uh, pollinators. So those will be our three uh, themes for next year. So just to, to summarize, what I encourage you to do is, is do one thing. I mean, there, sometimes it can be overwhelming. You're like, well, I'd like butterflies. I'd also like to protect bumblebees. I want to do something for these specialist bees. Um, but, you know, we only have so much time in the day and so much energy. Uh, maybe it's planting one, uh, one plant. One of my favorites um, that made its way into um, our, our themes, there we go, is uh, mountain mint. Does anybody grow mountain mint? So it has a wonderful minty smell. It doesn't grow, it's a native plant. It doesn't grow underground and come up through your bricks like uh, peppermint and spearmint. Um, it forms a clump and the clump does get larger, but it doesn't, um, it, it's, it's fairly easy to, to bring it back, um, to take out some of those side plants and share them with, with friends and neighbors. Uh, mountain mint has a tiny little flower um, so actually these, what we see here, the gray white is the fuzzy leaves at the top of mountain mint, uh, forms a nice flat top display. It can be really great for planting in mass. Um, and each of those little tiny individual mint uh, flowers has a little drink of nectar and it's gonna invite a lot of different bees, uh, little skippers and other butterflies, um, some predators and, uh, and maybe a few bumblebees as well. So I really encourage uh, you to plant a clustered mountain mint or one or the other. We have quite a few different species of, of mountain mint. Uh, and so my, uh, my website is blab.osu.edu. There's my email. It's ellsworth.2 at osu.edu. I invite you to um, email me with questions, to send me pictures of flowers it's a, or, or bees. Um, it's a lot better than some of the like policy emails that I get or like forms I'm supposed to read and fill out. So send me pictures of <laughs> cool things in your garden. Um, are there questions that anybody has about anything we, we talked about? Yes? On the garden cleanup thing, um, you know, I, I hear people say, you know, don't, don't cut off your plants, I mean, until the temperature hits 55. But right. this year, um, I didn't get it done, and then I twisted my knee, and then I really didn't get it done. Mm -hmm. I mean, can I do it in the... Sure. So, so garden cleanup is really um, confusing. And um, the best way to think about it is, let's say we planted one of these. We, we took Emily's design. <laughs> we planted one of the gardens, and the flowers, the plants grew, and they flowered this year. So this winter, nobody is overwintering in those stems. Right? What we need to do is cut those stems off, and then next year, somebody's going to move into those stems. Right? And so, um, you know, cleaning things up in the fall, cutting back stems in the fall that had flowers on them through the, through the season, 
it, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're not hurting anybody because nobody's nesting in there. It's really when you leave, so we go to the spring, we're cutting back those stems, or we can cut them back in the fall, but we leave them through the winter. It's that next season when somebody moves in. And then we have to not clean those up. You know, we can let them fall or we can bundle them and move them. Um, but it's, so the timing is confusing, but nobody is moving into stems that have flowers on them in the winter. Those are nice to leave up because the birds will often come, right, and feed on those seeds. But, um, but no bees are living in those stems. It's next year when they're cut off and because the bees can't break the stems, um, we have to cut them or they have to break from mother nature and then the bees can move into those hollow centers. So your confusion is shared by many. <laughs> sure. Any other questions? All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. I gave you a couple places in town uh, where you can go and try to see these gardens and, and watch some of the plants. Um, there was a, um, an Eagle Scout who, who started the native plant planting at the Center for the Arts uh, last year, really did a great job getting them started with, um, with all these different native plants. And now that project has expanded uh, and they have some of the plant by numbers plants. So a nice place just on the side of the building on the south side. Uh, a nice place to kind of go by and, and watch those plants grow. Have you seen the field next to the Western uh, Memorial Park? Oh, right, yeah. They have them to like all gold drives, and they have, they're trying different things like to keep the diversity in it, like keep it balanced. It gotcha. But right. It's, it's uh, beautiful as, as the colors change throughout the season. Sure. And we know in our gardens that things are always changing and evolving. And the same thing happens in a meadow um, that even though we may seed a new meadow with, you know, 12 or 20 different species, what comes up the first year is very different from the second year and the third year and what's going to be there in year 10. Right? And so often it's the goldenrods because they can, some of them can be kind of aggressive and move underground um, and kind of choke out some of that diversity. So it's not that goldenrod isn't a great plant, but it can become kind of a monoculture of, of goldenrod, which is great for those late season critters, but does nothing for, you know, kind of the early, the penstemons and, and monardas, some of those early visiting insects. Um, but it can be a challenge to, to keep that diversity going. So... All right, well, thanks again. Thanks for coming. Help yourself to more um, handouts, more seeds. Thanks for the seeds, for the library providing seeds. Oh, and I